My name is Travis Mortz, and I am a stay-at-home dad, first, <laughs> and photographer. I don't like to say film photographer, because that's stupid. I'm a photographer. I got into photography when I was 16 years old, and me and my friend Dylan went to a flea market. Dylan went to school and he had a darkroom class that he went to, like a real photo class. So he was into photography. He was into black and white shit. And so he already took like the sickest BMX photos out of all of us. And, and it was awesome. And so we're out there and we found a Nikon EM. And it was like 60 bucks with three lenses. And he was like, dude, that's a good deal. But I don't have money for that. And so... I don't know why, but I just felt like I wanted to take pictures of us riding. You know, I like, I rode with a different group of guys, so just because Dylan took pictures didn't necessarily mean that my friends were being documented by him, you know? So I got the camera, I shot like 10 or 15 rolls in the first month of having it, and it's like pretty much been on since then. Uh, okay, my favorite format. That's very weird because it's like I've shot so much 35 millimeters, so much medium format. But now that I've kind of started diving into the larger formats, like I don't know, like the smaller the smaller stuff almost feels insignificant, but it's not. But I don't know. I, I'd still have to say I, 35 millimeters is probably still my favorite format because it gives me the most freedom. And and the thing is, is that. When you start shooting 4x5 and you start shooting 8x10, those 35 millimeter frames really don't mean shit. And then you just burn through them. And I feel like since I've started shooting large, larger formats, I've enjoyed my 35 millimeter even more because I shoot it like it's like water, you know? And so I, I'll probably still say 35 millimeter because it captures all the shit in between where the larger formats capture the pinnacle or whatever you care about most. My dive into 8x10, I had this book for years, uh, a couple years. I got it from this old photography teacher. It was a, a, a Joel Meyerowitz book called Cape Light. And so I looked at it one day, and it was all 8x10 slide. It was like the most amazing shit. And it was like a bunch of photos of nothing, you know, like my kind of shit. Like I love making nothing look excellent. And so... I started reading the beginning of it and it talked about how Joel was a small format photographer, street photographer, how I like to consider myself. I like planking around. I like capturing the essence of a moment. And so here's Joel shooting 8x10 and he's my kind of photographer. And that spoke to me. How could I, how could I be so far in and not do that next thing? Because the reason I didn't want to do it was Eh, it just seems kind of inconvenient. And so I started looking for an 8x10 just because you got to you gotta get one. That's the hardest part about 8x10 is like, <laughs> it's not just something you find easily. You have to really go find it. And then uh, my buddy Steve asked if I wanted to borrow his. And I've wanted to borrow it for years, but it's like a really old piece of shit. So <laughs> I'm like, Ugh, I don't really want to shoot that old piece of shit because I break Steve's camera. So um, he loaned me it and... I shot like so many sheets right away and it was amazing and I was like I was fucked from that point. I'm just trying to shoot it differently than everybody else. You know, I'm trying to shoot BMX and because I already know I could shoot BMX on every other format. I shot the 4x5 Vans contest and after that it almost killed it for me actually. Like shooting the 4x5 out at that Vans contest it killed all doubt I had in myself. In, in my ability to do it. And then the challenge was gone. I was like, ugh, fuck. I don't care anymore. Like, I can do it. It's not really that hard. And I wanted it to be harder. Like, I wanted 4x5 BMX to be, like, a task. And, like, I figured it out pretty quickly. And I'm like, well, that's not very fun now. I want to do more hard shit. So, 8x10. Some photographers that inspired me. Of course, Joel... Joel Meyerowitz actually is one of my newer ones because of that book that was made in the 70s. Um, and the ones, you know, I always say the same people. So I'll, I'll say the same people again. It's always Dorothea Lang, you know, uh, 
Robert Frank. Love Gary Winogrand. I've been trying to find photographers lately that inspire me or that speak to me. So uh, recently I found uh, August Sander. This fucking dude. <laughs> August Sander, dude. Okay, August Sander died in like the 40s or 50s. But back in like the early 1900s, he's a German photographer and he decided that he wanted to document like every kind of profession, okay? Like he wanted to document basically society as a whole. So he would do straight portraits. So he had a guy in a bakery with a, a big silver bowl baking in a chef's outfit. It's like just an amazing uh, environmental portrait. And then he'd have, you know, some poor people and, and he would always do very straight photography and he he started building this body of work and so originally it was 60 images and so you got a policeman and you got um you know all, just all different professions and they're just very clean 1920s germany amazing portraits but this dude went like he just got consumed by it by this project and it became a 20 year project. And he ended up shooting over 40,000 images for it. But this is 40,000 images before 35 millimeter existed. Like this is 40,000 images, 40,000 sheets of fucking film. And he ended up building a catalog of like six volumes of all these people, of these different like professions. And it became like one of the greatest portrait uh, collections of German history. It's like he used, he almost used the project as an excuse to just shoot his ass off. That shit's been inspiring me. Like this dude, 20 years building this one body of work that he thought of on his own. Like, I'm gonna start building this body of work 20 years. And so, that, I don't know, August Sander, check him out. But I could talk forever about that. Uh, yeah, I absolutely do i do pre-visualize i i don't even know that i could help it it's just kind of how it goes i would say that pre-visualizing my photos is the biggest burden in my life i could see a photo before i even get to the place i want to photograph and it's like when you once you figure out photography a specific amount once you learn enough now my challenge is trying to find the images that i can't make so easily like you could pre-visualize a photograph and even think about how much depth of field you want. And even that's a factor, and that's a factor I know how to control. Oh, five, six, you know? And so the burden has now become how detailed my, my, visual, my visualization is, how detailed I, what I wanna shoot is. I wanna make it difficult and like, I don't know. It is, it's a weird thing, but it's a burden, I would say, because you can't turn it off and you can't stop seeing shit. And like, I mean, the part that the part about that though, like about pre-visualizing photographs, like based on the question, is I don't understand how other people don't. Like, and I that sounds weird. I don't understand how people who aren't photographers can ignore some things. Like when I'm driving and I see, like I'll, I'll see like uh, someone has a burn pile in our town and right as the sun's setting towards the end of the day, the, the light cuts through the trees and you can see all the light streaks coming through that burn smoke. And I just like, I just want to pull over and look at it. And I, I like, as a photographer, I feel like I'm enjoying this shit more than everybody else. Like I'm enjoying this light. Like, like probably once a day I say to Kelly or to someone, look at that light. Like, who the hell gives a shit? Like, we give a shit. And so, that is it. That's the, that's the part that you can't turn off. Always trying to make that image in my head come to life. And then when it does, I don't have anyone to tell about it. You're just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what I wanted. Sick. <laughs> Printing is very important. Um, printing, printing is the hardest thing. It's the hardest thing about photography today, which is kind of weird because it's so easy to do that we don't do it anymore. Like, like every photo of our birthday parties as children, like every photo that was ever taken as our, as our childhood, our parents would take to the store and they would get them developed. But nobody ever would just say develop only because 
we had no apparatus to see the damn photos. Nobody was putting them on the computer. Nobody was looking at them a- any way. There's no, there's no fucking <laughs> picture frame you can plug your film into. None of that. So the only way you could even see your shit was to get a print. So you would say, you know, <laughs> it wasn't do you want prints, it's do you want one print or do you want two prints? Singles or doubles. So a lot of people got doubles, which means that we have twice as many photos as have been taken. So, you know, I go, I go look through my archives as a child and my mom has every negative, which is the first physical. And then she's got every print, which is the sec- second physical copy. And then there might even be a double, which would be a third physical copy. That was the default. That's what we started with. That's what photography was. That's how everybody did shit. And then digital came along and the ease of printing became so easy. The problem is that you don't have to anymore. In order to see my photos, I could just see my photos. And printing is a afterthought. Printing is a decision to be made. It was not the only decision to be made. It is, it, you could choose not to now. What we forget about is that Unlike my mom's photos, we don't even have the first physical copy to print later. We have no physical copy until we make one. And so it's, it's shitty because you have to do it. You have to print. Once you lose that non-physical copy, you don't get to decide later and you don't get to choose. And when I see parents like shooting cell phone photos at parties, it, it scares the shit out of me. Like it literally terrifies me and so when I go to the Apple store and they ask me if I want to back up my phone I say no I don't give a shit those are all screenshots and video clips of video games and nothing I care about because why on earth would I use that I need something I need that physical so anyways to answer the question yes printing is photography you have to do it we all have to do it we have to do it more because the fact of the matter is Everybody watching this, we're all photographers. We're all dedicated. You guys have all probably spent at least $5,000 on photography. If you, if you care about it a little bit, you've probably spent that much. And my mom has more prints than all of you guys. All of you guys. My mom's got more prints than all of you guys. And, and she's not a photographer. They're disposable photos. Like they're, <laughs> but she's got more. She's got more prints than me, you guys. Like I have a fucking dark room. I have like enlargers in here. I got two gel bows and my mom has more prints than I do. That's, that's saying something. We make more prints than my mom has. <laughs> so I think the way I feel about film in a digital world is that a lot of times, get out of here. Beat it. A lot of times people get, um, I have really strong opinions online and people get mistaken and they think that, they think that I just want everything to be analog. I've had, I'll say, I've had stupid ass people (laughs) say, why don't you film your YouTube videos on Super 8 then? I'm like, you guys aren't understanding that you don't need everything to be shot on film, but there's some things that fucking matter. And so yeah, like, NFL football games, like, shoot that shit on a digital video camera. Like, absolutely. Like, yes, I get it. Like, anything for YouTube, like, for sure. Like, all this Instagram clips, all that shit. But, like, recognize the fact that this is temporary media. And that's why it's so useful. But, like I said earlier with the birthday parties, your kid's birthday party is not an NFL broadcast, and we might want to see it again in 10 years. Or 15. And we need to be able to find it again. I was just watching a documentary on the rise of computers and shit. Like, you guys realize, like, computers just got popular in the 90s. The home computer is as old as the Spice Girls. Like, that's how long this shit's been in our house. Spice Girls, Windows 95. Like, (laughs) we got them at the same fucking time. We haven't been doing this very long. We've been doing it this much time. We do not have it figured out yet. We don't know what the hell we're doing. We jumped on the bandwagon. We bought the technology. We love it. But it's not foolproof. And it's not... It never promised to keep our memories safe. Never. Never has any digital camera maker ever promised to keep your memories safe. They just... They just promised to help you make them. But it's up to you after that. And we need some physical shit. We need something in a box that I could just go grab. 
that's why film in the digital world is mandatory. We have to have that physical copy to keep us, uh, I don't know, accountable, I guess, to keep our memories safe. Otherwise, they're just memories. Otherwise, they're just stories. I don't ever want to hear about, like, stories about photos. And that's really all we're making. Like, every cell phone photo is a future story about a photo you took. And that grosses me out. Lab processing versus do-it-yourself. This is a great question. So, as you guys know, I have a lab where I charge people to develop their film. And... That makes me money, which is great. And I don't want to develop your film. Like, I do not want to develop your film. I want you to develop your film. I want all of you guys to develop your film. Because that's how you get better. Like, I'm, I, I provide the service because people need the service. And I don't mind providing it because I do it myself anyways. But it's quite literally so easy that I've decided to take on other people's workload. Because it's so easy. It's so foolproof. You haven't fully understood your camera until you shoot a roll and see it that day. Like, you haven't fully understood what the hell's going on until you could actually remember taking every frame on the roll and seeing the results. With film, we're out there in the world with our camera. Everybody's like, oh, I'm shooting a roll. I hope the photos come out. I got some really good photos on this roll as long as it turns out good. Like, what the hell does that mean? It's light sensitive film. You're hitting it with an image. The camera only makes an image coming through that lens. It's always making an image. It doesn't make anything else. It's making an image every time. It's always an image. People think it's a, a risk. And people think it's a risk because they don't ever see it happen. They shoot it and they send it away and they hope, oh, I hope it works. I hope it works. And then it comes back and they're like, yes. It fucking worked. It's like, you guys don't understand how easy it is. Like, the photos are always on the roll. You guys did a great job, always. And the developing is literally foolproof. Like, so that's always dialed. So you're always going to get images. Until you do that process, until you pull that wet film out of the tank, until you see me in my darkroom saying, this shit's so easy, you think it's hard. And you're scared. And, and so, I don't know. You have to process at home. Like, I encourage people to process their own film, but it's hard for me to do it in the position I'm in at this point because now I've got like this stupid, ridiculous lab. Like, but like I built this lab with less than a thousand dollars. Like I've built all the pieces and parts in there and it all started in my bathroom. It's easier than cooking breakfast. It's easier than making brownies. Like so easy. And, but you know, I know it's hard because I'm telling you guys to buy this shit and you have nothing. All you really need is running water. And if you have running water, like I could develop film in my camper if I wanted to because it has running water and that's all you need. So, okay. So Dave said 20 rolls at a lab will buy you. And that's definitely true. 20 rolls of developing at the darkroom lab. You're going to, you're going to be able to buy a scanner and all the hardware you need to develop your own shit. And by the time you do buy that stuff, I think it costs maybe 50 cents a roll for black and white film to develop, maybe 50 cents. And that's just because I have to give it a number. Like I want to just say it costs nothing because obviously that's not true. It cost me $12 for developer, <laughs> but you know, I think it, I spend more money on In-N-Out Burger every year than I do on film processing myself. And I do your guys' film too. So that's that. Mm -hmm.